Because of the country's major ports on the North Sea and its trade and supply routes through the Scandinavian archipelago, Britain was planning to occupy Norway. By the 1st of March 1940, Hitler had realized this and was persuaded that a preemptive invasion was essential. We were going to occupy Norway and the Germans beat it to us by about two or three days because we wanted to stop the supply of iron ore to Germany which was being shipped across to Narvik and then brought down in, in the uh, inland uh, waters. The Norwegian fjords could provide valuable cover to German ships harrying Allied vessels in the North Sea. Eric Topp was officer of the watch on the German submarine U-46. He was waiting in the fjords to attack the British battleship HMS Warspite. One day the Warspite was uh, coming in with uh, four destroyers and we were in an excellent position for attacking thousand meters distance round about and uh, we were, we were opening the torpedo tubes and uh, everything was clear for shooting and in that moment we hit an, an underwater rock and uh, so the boat was uh, coming up and uh, a little bit surfacing but only a little bit the commanding officer lost his nerves and he said uh, full, uh, full force back and uh, close the torpedo tubes and the war spot disappeared. The narrowness of the Norwegian fjords meant that ships had little space to take evasive action. So HMS Resolution was a sitting target when the Luftwaffe attacked. These aircraft, German aircraft, would appear over the top of the mountains um, and before you hardly had chance to fire, they dropped the bombs and gone. This lone plane came over, breakfast, dinner and tea, as we were just about to sit down, so the alarm went and you left your food and you run up on the upper deck and we manned the, manned the guns that I was manning, which was a Sandy aircraft gun. When you're closed up on those twin four-inch anti-aircraft guns, you're firing about 20 rounds a minute. Sometimes the noise is so bad um, that you just don't know really what is going on. The Norwegian campaign was a disastrous failure for the Allies. In June, Norway was evacuated and abandoned to the Germans. At the very end, we ran completely out of ammunition. The captain said we, you know, clear lower deck and told us that we were sailing back, sailing out, and everybody cheered. They just, they said we don't care if the whole German Navy is outside there, as long as we can get out and have a go at something that we can see and not something dropping bombs on us. The Germans had proved to themselves and to the rest of the world that coordinating the specialized skills of their army Navy and Air Force led to success. Warfare had changed, as France was about to discover. On the 5th of April 1940, Germany invaded Norway, strategically important both for its coastline and its iron ore. The British had guarded against a German naval attack, but not against what actually happened, an airborne invasion. The few British troops stationed in Norway were not enough to prevent the country falling to the invaders. The campaign was a disaster for the British. Even though the Norwegian campaign was directed largely by Britain's first Lord of the Admiralty, Winston Churchill, the man who had to take responsibility was Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain. He resigned on the 9th of May 1940. 
Ironically, the failure of a campaign directed largely by Churchill brought Chamberlain down and Churchill up. On the 10th of May 1940, Churchill became Britain's new Prime Minister. Earlier that morning, German tanks roared into Holland and Belgium. The Western offensive had begun. In September 1939, the British Expeditionary Force, commanded by General Gort, had crossed to France and was stationed along the Belgian border. They were ill-prepared and ill-equipped. In trying to make up the numbers of our tanks, uh, they robbed all sorts of training uh, regiments and took tanks away from them to give to us. And I got one of those tanks passed on to me and uh, we found straight away that it had a, a defective reverse gear. Sometimes it would go in gear, sometimes it wouldn't. And my poor driver would sit there cursing at you, get in, get in. <laughs> and it was a big joke in my regiment because uh, when I talked about it to other, you know, members of tank crews, they said, well, you're all right. You've got the only non-reversing tank in the regiment. <laughs> my crew and I didn't enjoy that joke. We were given five rounds of ammunition and told, under no circumstances must we put this in the breech, in the rifle, the magazine, unless ordered to do so. Our dispatch riders were riding around with revolver holsters, leather ones, packed with two pieces of wood. That's how well off we were for equipment. Thanks to their outstanding speed and excellent coordination, the German forces rapidly gained ground in Belgium. Our first job was to try to get in into Belgium, to stop them if we could. But when we arrived in Belgium, we went more than approximately about four to five days, and we had to go back because we were unfortunately mobilized with horses while the Germans had tanks. We hardly had anything. Hitler had spent five years building up the German forces and by 1940 they were a well-equipped, fully prepared and properly coordinated invasion force. In the early 1930s, on the defensive rather than the offensive, the French had built the linked concrete bunkers of the Maginot Line along their border with Germany. The Maginot Line ran from Switzerland to Luxembourg, but, crucially, didn't continue all the way to the coast. The French were confident that German tanks wouldn't be able to get through the Ardennes forest at the end of the Maginot Line. But they were wrong, and on the 11th of May, German tanks began smashing their way into France, straight through the Ardennes forest. It amused me that a lot of people were thinking that the Maginot Line is going to stop the Germans, which how foolish some of them thought about that, for the only reason because the Germans were just flying over and they were just going around it, and the Maginot Line was completely ignored. The Germans' stunning success was due to Blitzkrieg, lightning war. Fast armoured units ripped through enemy lines, leaving the infantry to encircle their opponents' confused flanks. Fundamental to the success of Blitzkrieg was the support of the Luftwaffe, which cleared the way for the tanks and infantry. The most Einsätze waren Heeresunterstützungseinsätze. 